So just a quick introduction. Um, thank you for joining the, this webinar. Uh, rock physics integration from pet to physics to simulation. Some of you might have joined uh, a few other webinars. We've had a series uh, this year. Uh, this one will go all the way from seismic to well core, all the way to all the way to simulation. Uh, and Reza, Reza is our global rock physics expert. He's involved with different rock physics R&D projects in CDG, and he also gives worldwide training on rock physics and its practical link with other subsurface disciplines. Uh, and just in case some of our uh, London-based colleagues are interested, he will also be presenting next week in London at the uh, London Physical Society on the 27th. I can send you more details uh, after the webinar. But with further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Reza to get started. Okay, thank you, Jasmine. Hello, everyone, and thanks uh, for attending this uh, webinar. Today, I'm going to talk about the more general rule of rock physics which name as rock physics integration from petrophysics to simulation. Here I'm going to cover a wide range of application for rock physics. So you will see some example from different disciplines that rock physics is involved. And in the end, uh, you will see how our final results can be improved using rock physics. So uh, let me start uh, with giving an outline of this presentation to you. Uh, first, I will give you a very quick introduction on what is rock physics and how you can see its rule within different, uh, let's say, subsurface domains. Then I will go to each of these domains. I will start from petrophysics. So I will give uh, uh, some examples and short um, introduction on the link between rock physics and petrophysics. Then I will go to the link between rock physics and seismic. I will show you some examples, practical examples on how rock physics can help you to make a better link with your seismic and seismic inversion. Then I will jump to rock physics and geomechanics. You will see some examples how rock physics can help us in making a better geomechanical model. It's quite new in these disciplines and it's still under, uh, I can say, development for better results, but it's quite interesting. You will see some results, how it can act and how it can help you in subsurface modeling. And in the last, I will go to the link between rock physics and reservoir engineering. I will sh show you some examples how rock physics in this regard can help you to make a better simulation or forecast of your, uh, let's say, production from a field, from a given field. Uh, so let me start uh, then with intro general introduction about the rock physics. So if you look at the, um, uh, the book on the rock physics property from Schoon in 1996, he has a very interesting sentence about the rock physics. He described rock physics as an integrated and integrating part in each process for the subsurface modeling. So he described it that rock physics is integrated into general techniques and also it is at the same time has the integrating rule. So here two words are emphasizing by this sentence that uh, I think it's very uh, important to, to understand and to know them is that rock physics is integrated and rock physics is integrating. Rock physics is integrated, it means that it is integrated within each discipline you are using. If you are a petrophysicist, you use rock physics as a part of your, let's say, workflow. If you are a geophysicist or you, you are working with seismic, you still use rock physics as part of your workflow. And then uh, its integrating rule is the case that uh, when you are petrophysicist, you are geophysicist, you are reservoir engineer, you need one common point to share the data, to confirm your results against each other, and that's again rock physics. So rock physics here as act as can act also as integrating part. So rock physics is both integrated and integrating in subsurface disciplines. And this is the main point also of this presentation. In this presentation, I'm going to show you how rock physics is going to act as integrated and as integrating part, uh, integrating part within your subsurface discipline. Yeah. So when we are saying that rock physics is integrating and integrated you can imagine of uh, uh, such image that now i'm showing you so we have different subsurface disciplines to describe your rock reservoir rock we have geology we have petrophysics we have reservoir engineering seismic and geomechanics so each of them each of these uh, tools or each of the, uh, these approaches look at the subsurface reservoir from its own point of view but we know the, the reservoir rock is the same and just the looking angle is changes. 
So how we can put or how we can make them consistent together is the rock physics. So rock physics is the answer how we can make a consistent model. Rock physics can make different link with the geology, petrophysics, reservoir, and other subsurface disciplines. And then you can share information through the rock physics from another from one discipline to another discipline. For instance, in seismic, we normally lack low frequency model. How we get this low frequency model? We can get it from the petrophysics, from the well locks. This can go through the rock physics and make your low frequency parts or just compensate for your low frequency part in seismic and you can make your uh, subsurface uh, model uh, more accurate. So here today I'm going to talk very quickly uh, about the link between petrophysics, uh, reservoir engineer, geomechanic and geophysics with rock physics. On the geology part, geology part actually is the constraining part of the rock physics model. If you have, if you know your geology, geology can constrain the number of models that you can choose for a field. The input uh, which goes to your, let's say, rock physics model, like pore aspect ratio, like mineralogy, these are all decided by geology. So we can say that geology constrains your rock physics model, your rock physics workflow, and then in the rest, I will talk more about the links between rock physics and other disciplines. Let me start with the link between rock physics and petrophysics. Normally, petrophysics is the part that rock physics modeling is started. So you need some parts or some stages to start your rock physics modeling, and petrophysics is a good candidate to start such a process. We can define uh, two type of the petrophysics. Uh, those who are petrophysicists, uh, they, uh, they know that in the conventional petrophysics, normally we have one depth and one value. Yeah, and we can define another type of petrophysics. We call it a seismic petrophysics. In the seismic petrophysics, we are mainly interested in the boundary between two layers. You know that the seismic, what seismic sees is the boundary, is the difference between the uh, overburden and the reservoir layer. Yeah, you, we can see that part. So the seismic petrophysics is the petrophysics uh, approach that look at the interval characteristics, not at the each steps and each value. So for that one, you, you need two beds and one boundary, and seismic petrophysics can see that boundary. Here, in a few, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk mainly about the difference between conventional petrophysics and seismic petrophysics, and how you can get more benefit using seismic petrophysics. Seismic petrophysics actually here means the petrophysics that is integrated with the uh, rock physics. So it's also called a seismic petrophysics. So what's the main difference between them? If you look at the conventional petrophysics, normally what you uh, you will have uh, you will have porosity, saturation, volume of the minerals, permeability, and your goal is to know how much is your net pay or how much hydrocarbon is within your reservoirs. But within the seismic petrophysics, we, we may use the same inputs or we need the same parameters. But our goal is not to have the net pay. Our goal is to see what's the reflection. What will the, what will the reflection changes when the properties of either of these layers are changing? So this is the main difference between seismic petrophysics and conventional petrophysics. If I want to say it in more, uh, let's say, figures, you will see that here I have some well locks. I have a reservoir interval, you see here. And this reservoir interval has a uh, somehow boundary, a border, that uh, uh, make it different from the over, overburden layer. So seismic sees this uh, layer or this boundary, but, uh, but conventional petrophysics sees each depth and each values. This means that when you are interested in seismic petrophysics, you are interested to know about the overburden, you, you are interested to know about the reservoir, and also how much they are different, uh, they are different for, from each other. It means that the variation that you get at the boundaries. And this is what happens uh, with the seismic petrophysics. But the conventional petrophysics normally do not really care about this one and care about one depth, one value. And then at the end, it's going to calculate your reservoir volume within the reservoir. So if I want to say it in more schematic form, you will say that in the petrophysics and rock physics connection, if you are uh, looking at the conventional petrophysics, you, normally petrophysics start the job with QC data and going through the modeling and parameters. And then there is a solid boundary 
between petrophysics and rock physics. It means that petrophysics and rock physics do not talk to each other. They are not communicating with each other. So after the petrophysics job is finished, then normally if you have this complete set of elastic, it will go to the Veltoy analysis and you will see the results of that. Geophysics, on the other hand, will start its uh, modeling, not from the petrophysics part, from the data he has or from the log he has, and then he will uh, build his own model and then will, will go toward the characterization and interpret subsurface based on that model. Here you see that there are some inconsistency between what petrophysics and what geophysics or rock physics are doing. So this is the conventional petrophysics. And you, you can see on the right part, the red one is the model log and the black one is the measured locks. You, you will do your best, you will tune your parameters. So the best match you can get, it's something like here. You will see on the reservoir, it's, a, it's not a very bad match, but it's not, it, but it can be improved. What we are, uh, what I'm trying to uh, say here is that this match can be improved with seismic petrophysics. Let me now show you what rock, rock, uh, physics, seismic rock physics or seismic petrophysics seems. In the seismic petrophysics, we are, we, we are removing the boundary between petrophysics and rock physics. Then there is a direct link between the output from the petrophysics and input to the rock physics. It means that if you see any inconsistency between your measured and model one, you don't need to only just back to the parameters and uh, improve the parameters. You can even back to the petrophysics and um, modify or update some of the logs, like the porosity, like the uh, volume of the minerals. And after you do the iteration, again, you back to the uh, Veltai analysis, and then you, you check that part. If it's okay, then that's fine. If not, again, back to the petrophysics. So it's the iteration process that can go for several iterations. And after you are happy, or petrophysics and geophysics both are happy with the results, then it can end and it can come to a final, let's say, results. Here you can see on the uh, right part the, the, the well lock for the same example. The black again is the measured, and the red is the modified or is the model uh, log using seismic petrophysics approach. Here you can see I get much more better if I go back to my previous slide. You see here how I improved. How, how I improve my modeling results using the seismic petrophysics. So the first benefit of the seismic petrophysics is that what you are uh, um, uh, interpreting in petrophysics as volume of the minerals, as porosity, saturation, everything will be more consistent with what geophysics sees. Because what you are doing here, you are putting more emphasizes on the principles that geophysics is taking, is caring about them. Let me give you a very quick example on the GOM example, Gulf of Mexico example. Here you see uh, uh, some well logs. We have sonics, we have resistivity, density, and other well logs. You see on the sonic part, on the uh, second uh, track from right, that there are some uh, sonic spikes. Here you see, this is my pay and my water, and there are some sonic spikes here. So what's the normal procedure here? Normally, the normal procedure here is that the petrophysicist goes through these locks, he sees the sparks, so do the spiking to get rid of these sparks, because these sparks uh, mainly can come from the cycle skipping or any other noises, and they need to be removed. But this is not very theoretical approach, as these sparks can come also from some calcite strings or any other mineralogical strings can make high uh, amplitude for your sonics. So the more acceptable approach is that if you do the modeling using your input and see if these sparks are geologically meaningful or not. If not, then in your model, they will be removed if they are meaningful from the geology point, point of view or from the petrophysics point of view, then they will be included in your modeling. So what I'm going to do here, I'm not going to do the spiking or any other things. I'm going to model them and then see how my model looks compared with these measured logs. So uh, here also in this log, I do not have any shear wave uh, or DTS, shear, shear sonic. So I need to regenerate or to generate them as well. So what I do, I will go uh, for the petrophysics. They will do the petrophysical interpretation. They will give me some logs. Here you see, I have the effective porosity. I have also the uh, water saturation in the red curves. They are added to, uh, to my curves. So the, uh, these curves has been interpreted using petrophysical approaches or my petrophysics just interpreted the logs based on this. And then what I do, I go to the rock physics modeling part. In the rock physics modeling part, I know that the normal petrophysic logs are affected by different environmental factors. One of these factors could be the uh, washout zone 
or invasion zones. So in the invasion zone, what happens? In invasion zones, your mud rock filtrate uh, fluid will invade into the into the you know, formation, uh, uh, let's say fluid, and it will replace the formation fluid. This means that the well logs will be uh, seeing those mud filtrate uh, fluid instead of the actual fluid in the subsurface. This will happen for the uh, petrophysics, for the well logs, but seismic has a lower frequency, so it will not affect it by this one. So this is a very common problem in the petrophysics. Petrophysics normally try to address this by different approaches, but this is not very easy to address them or correct them. Uh, so if you are, you, you are receiving the data, the chance, and you have a, a deep invasion, the chance that you have this invasion effect on your sonic logs or even on your density log is too much. And one of the things that, uh, to correct for them, uh, for them correctly is the rock physics. Here what I do, first I compute SAXO or I get it from, the, uh, from petrophysics. If you do not have it, you can assume that your SAXO, which is the invasion zone saturation, uh, it's like SW, SW is the water zone saturation, SAXO is the invasion zone saturation. You can assume as some com kind of practical point is equal to uh, SW to the power of 0 0.25. So you start from this value and you will model your SXO, uh, let's say, in, um, uh, area that has been affected. The first thing in the rock physics modeling I need to model is the density. So, because density is easier or more straightforward to model. So, I start with modeling density. I start my rock physics modeling by modeling density. And then after I am happy with the density part, I will go to the modeling elastic or moduli part of the, uh, let's say, rock physics modeling part. Here, density follow the simple material balance. You can see here that uh, your log density is equal to the density of the solid part plus the density of your fluid, which are mixed together. So if you have two fluid, you need to have the volume fraction of each one and then just put them into your equation. So what I do here, here you see, I'm using the porosity. Porosity is the part that uh, contain fluid. And then uh, I have also SW and SXO. So I start to make my model here, right physics model here. And then I get the uh, different logs here. Uh, for this one, uh, to, uh, to model the, uh, let's say, acoustic part, I need to go to a more advanced workflow, which I did here. So for this one, here you, sh uh, you see, uh, the rock physics uh, model that I made in our software RPM in the in PowerLock. So here, what I did, I first modeled each fluid at different temperature and uh, let's say uh, pressure. Here you see on the uh, on the upper part of the workflow, we call it as a fluid modeling. So if you think that in this reservoir there are three two or three fluids, you need to model each of them based on the already existing empirical models. Then what you do, then you go and mix this fluid together to have one effective fluid. You have different models for them. Here I use BRI model to just combine all of these fluid together. So here I combine them here. And then the next part is that I need to uh, model the clay part. Clay is very important and tricky. Uh, within the let's say other minerals it can just it has lots of the different uh, properties compared with quartz and other uh, clean uh, minerals so you need to first take care of the clay so clay velocity and density and also bulk and shear modules ne needs to be first modeled using appropriate uh, let's say approaches after you did that part then you can go and model the porosity and the solid part of the rock. So what I'm doing here, I'm now making the structure or skeleton of the rock using the uh, clay and also the cream minerals together. And after this, what I do, I first, I model the density part, as I mentioned earlier. So you need the first density. I, I first make density and then I model uh, my velocity after that. And when I'm happy, when, when I'm done the velocity part, then I can go and compare my velocity, my model sonics, with the measured sonics here that it's done in this node. And then in the end, I'm going toward the, uh, let's say seismic, so I need impedances. So I will calculate impedances from this model's velocity in another node. And then uh, my modeling actually is finished and you can see the results here. So here, I just put the final results for you. So you see the sonic here, it's after some iteration. I have uh, iterated on some properties like the FIT, uh, like the effective porosity and also saturation. And you see the final results here. As you can see here, I have the model curve as red and measured one as 
black, you see my uh, sonic spikes has already been removed here. Also, I have corrected for invasion. The, the model, the, the logs that I received from my Petrophys has already been corrected for invasion, but there was a little uh, effect has already been remained in, 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 into those logs. So what here you see, there is still a big difference between the modeled and measured, and this comes from the invasion. You can see even in the blue part of the log that the invasion has been addressed. And now if I use from now on, as a geophysicist, instead of those measured logs, I will use these model logs, the red one that I showed here. And what happens when I do them, when I use them? When I use them, normally uh, as a geophysicist, I should go and have the cross plot. So I can see a better separation on the cross plot. You know, if for those of you who are geophysicists, uh, you know how much is important to see such separation and to map them into, the, uh, into your seismic. So if you are going to find your net pay zone, you need to see these separations. And if you have a more cleaner data, it means that less noise is involved because your rock physics modeling is not affected by environmental noises. So you can see a better separation here. You can see here, I get a better separation between my pay and non pay zone. So my next step, which is reservoir characterization, will be less affected by some unwanted noises like these invasion effects. So here, I get better separation. This means that it can secure better results after the end of my, uh, let's say, characterization. There is another advantage of this, let's say, uh, denoising your data using rock physics, and is that the, uh, you will have a better wavelet. You know, for the geophysics, wavelet is very important. If you are going to convert your data into your reservoir properties, having a good estimation of the wavelet is very crucial for you. If you have a bad wavelet, then your inversion will not really work very efficiently. Here you can see I have two wavelets, one black and another one red. So the black is the one that I received, I, I get after the rock physics part, uh, seismic petrophysics, and the red one is the from the measured uh, logs or the one with the noise. So here I improved also my estimated wavelet that normally this estimation comes from a combination between the well logs and seismic. So here my well logs are improved, so my wavelet also are improved. So you can see I can get a better wavelet in the end and I can use the new wavelet in my inversion or characterization procedure. And this is the final results here. You see how much my, my results are getting better and better, and also I have also compensated for some of the missing data. So from this data, I start my characterization, I start describing my subsurface rock and sub subsurface res uh, reservoir, and I'm hoping to get a better result with this one because now I am working based on some physics-based phenomena. So I will remove all of the things that physically is not possible for this set of geology. Another advantage that my rock physics gives to me is that I can have what if scenarios. You know that the well are delivered at the specific location. So at that location, your, your reservoir has a certain amount of or certain type of the fluid. It can either be uh, brine, oil, or uh, gas, or combination of them. But if you have a rock physics model, you can have a prediction power. You can you have a prediction tool that you will see what if here my reservoir fluid is only water, or what if my reservoir fluid is only brine or gas. So here you see an example that using a rock physics model to have what if scenarios. What if your reservoir fluid is specific and is not given at the at the well location? So first I tied my model with the fluid in the reservoir. I did, I did all the corrections. Now I have a corrected model and I can have another scenarios like uh, what if I have here brine previously I had brine and gas and based on that I can have a better idea regarding the fluid changes within the whole reservoir and then use them in the seismic so in general I can say if you have a final or tuned rock physics model with its parameter, then you will have a much more, uh, let's say, opportunities in the next step that you are going to the characterization. One of them that I show you quickly is the wavelet estimation. Another one is that you will have an improved well tie. So you, your well tie, because geophysicists normally when they have some problem with the well tie, they, or if they 
get some mismatch, normally they do the stretch and squeeze. But stretch and squeeze is not aimed for uh, addressing some of the logging problems. If you do you do a stretch and squeeze for logging problem, then you are forcing your, uh, let's say, corrections to be biased toward one specific, uh, uh, let's say, error. Here, you, you need to use rock physics to address that one. I will show you some example on that part. Also, you can have an improved A view. So your A view classification will be improved using this rock physics model, uh, corrected uh, logs for rock physics model. Even you can go and have a better low frequency model. You know, the starting point of the, uh, of the inversion algorithm or low frequency model. So I will improve my low frequency model using this rock physics corrected logs. And in the end, I can use these logs for a better inversion results interpretation interpretation because you have the inversion results as acoustic impedance or as other elastics but you need to link them to the reservoir properties and what can do that for you is a rock physics model so it can also help you with the I, I will show you in a few next slides some examples of this application of the corrected uh, petrophysic logs in seismic uh, inversion and characterization so let me go to the next topic, which is the rock physics and seismic, and we'll cover all of those uh, disciplines that I show you earlier. We know that uh, when you model your velocity and density uh, as a geophysicist, if you want to create your synthetics first, you need to multiply them together. So you multiply your velocity log to your density log, you will have impedance log. And then from the impedance, you will go to the reflection coefficient. And when you are in the reflection coefficient, you need a good wavelet to convolve with your reflection coefficient to, to generate synthetics. So you generate a synthetics, and then what you do? you compare this synthetic with the seismic. There is a general workflow, as you can see here. It's made, maybe it's a bit uh, small, the fonts here, but it's actually described what I have done so far or, or what I have described you so far, that you start from the pure petrophysical data, you do rock physics modeling, you compare the results between the measured and model logs, then you go to the seismic and um, uh, check against the seismic. If you are happy, that's fine. If not, then you will back to your petrophysics and do the iteration again. And do this iteration until you are happy with your rock physics model or with your uh, comparison between the synthetic and seismic. And here, we call it as a confirmed rock physics model. It means that you have a rock physics model that is confirmed through petrophysics and seismic. And this is very important for your characterization. Here I'm showing you some example in this regards. Here you see I have uh, a set of well logs. These well logs are used to generate synthetics. So uh, one of the scenarios is before doing uh, seismic petrophysics or before correcting the logs, you see on the right panel, I have two set of the synthetics and seismic. On the left part of the panel, you see uncorrected one. It means that I, uh, it means that here I get it from the Vols et al. 2004. Here it means that they have used the measured log with some errors in, uh, inside them to generate synthetics, and you see the synthetic and seismic are not map matching each other. You see the both synthetic and seismic uh, on the track beside each other. On the right part, you see the corrected part. The corrected part can follow something that uh, something like that I show you earlier. On, in the previous slide, and then you correct the logs for the physical problems that can be seen in a well due to any problems like invasion effect, uh, washouts, or any other problems. You just use rock physics modeling, some physics-based models to correct for those ones. Here you see on the right part, I get my, they get a much more better, uh, let's say, cross-correlation between their synthetics and seismic. This implies that what they are using as the reservoir properties now is more closer to the, what seismic is, so they can be more synchronized or they are more consistent with each other. This is a very good example to show you how petro rock physics, petrophysics, or improved petrophysics logs can help you with a better result. This is another uh, example uh, is taken from JSON software, our uh, characterization software. You see, I have seismic, synthetic, and then the correlation and also impedance. Between the seismic and synthetic, I do not get a very good uh, here match. But after improving the impedance logs, you see my improve, uh, my uh, cross correlation is improved quite a lot. And this happens only by improving my uh, velocity and density logs that here you see that the P impedance log. So this is another example that show you how this uh, workflow can help you to address some of the problems that is not already been seen by petrophysicists and it can make consistent with the uh, geophysicists. 
This is another one, another example. I, uh, I take it from CD et al. 2006. Here you see I have some initial sonic and density log and I have some model, uh, uh, model log, the same logs are modeled. Here you see there are four uh, intervals that have problem and you get a mismatch between your measured and your, uh, sorry, your synthetic and your measured seismic. Uh, the first part you see here is coming from the cycle, sk uh, cycle skipping. I address that. They address that by having the model data replaced with the measured one. So they did the rock physics modeling. The, f the second one is the missing data, which can happen when you have different run of the well logging. And then uh, when the runs are joined together, normally they do interpolation. But if you do the rock physics modeling, you can avoid this uh, missing interval and have the model instead of interpolation between them. The third one is the washout zone. So this is the effect what washout wound will, uh, will make on your well logs. And then these small changes can have a big effect on your synthetic, which will go furthermore to your characterization. And the last one, again, is the invasion zone. I show another, I show example already. So you see how invasion zone can affect your, uh, your uh, synthetics and then how this match can be, uh, uh, you will get a poor match, not correcting the logs. This is another example for AVO. So for the AVU part, you see, uh, I have on the right uh, panel for both uh, image, I have weekly and saturation, and then uh, I have se seismic and synthetic. You see, the, you see there. So uh, when uh, uh, when you are looking at this from the AVU point of view, I just highlighted two intervals for you. One is the one uh, on the top, which showing the AVU anomaly. So falling A1 only over cold zone. Another one is in the below part of that, which you do not see any A1 anomaly. But in reality, they are different. So let's see. Uh, yeah, I didn't put that image here. But here it means that uh, if you see by changing my weekly and saturation, my A1 anomaly are uh, changes. So this means that your seismic petrophysics, if you have the pre-stack data, you can, you can generate the anomalies that you see in the pre-stack data. Uh, just by having the improved uh, estimation of your petrophysical properties, your, like weekly and saturation. Another example comes from low frequency model. So low frequency model is the part that your inversion algorithm starts its inversion based on that. So here you see again two uh, different scenarios. On the left, you see the measured log data. The measured log data uh, are used to make the, the, normally you do interpolation between different wells you have and you make a low frequency model out of it. And on the right, you see the model log data. Just by quick scanning of that, you will see on the, using the measured log data, you have some bullet points, so you, uh, some kind of the anomalies around each wells and they are not consistent or you don't have a smooth transition from one well to another or within the whole area. But when you are using the model data, you get a more consistent image of the subsurface. So this is more realistic than having just some anomalies or some kind of the high and low amplitude when you go from one well to another well. So I get a much more smoother or much more closer to reality uh, low frequency model using my uh, model logs in this case. And then I will use the same model uh, or the same low frequency model to do inversion on my uh, seismic. Here you see the result of such a process if you use two different low frequency models. You will see where you will end up with. On the left, again, you see the uh, the capture of uh, the reservoir thickness using the measured logs and the reservoir thickness using the model logs. You see you will end up with two different images of your subsurface. This is just because you are using different low frequency model. Your seismic still is the same. So this is small effects that I have corrected earlier in my petrophysics in the end of the cycle of characterization can have a big effect and you will end up in totally different area if you are not taking care of them. So here it shows how it is important for you to make your logs corrected and how this procedure should be with accurate, let's say models and procedure. Otherwise, what you are getting at the end of your seismic characterization may not be, uh, may not, uh, may not be really even near to what is in the subsurface and you will get lots of the drivels. So let me go to another topics. Uh, here I'm just going, just showing some uh, examples very quickly, passing through the examples to show the importance of the rock physics and rock physics modeling in different disciplines. So uh, apologize me if I'm going very fast to these uh, disciplines. I just want to make you 
aware of these applications. So the, the, the next one is the rock physics and geomechanics link. In the rock physics and geomechanics link, we will use rock physics to adopt your petrophysical uh, logs and also your seismic toward the stress and strain uh, magnitude and values. So we know that the Earth is a stressful place. It means that you, you, you will have different stresses that are objected on the Earth from different, uh, let's say, resources, or from faulting or tectonics or whatever. What happens to this? Uh, stresses, when these stresses are inserted on the subsurface rocks, they are tending to have different fractures. They will have uh, uh, some, uh, let's say, you will have some unst instability in the subsurface, and this will, case, uh, this will uh, um, result in some problems. And geomechanics application is mainly uh, is uh, to address such problems in the subsurface due to the difference between the stress and strain in the rocks. So it can come to determining the stability during the drilling. So if you are drilling at some well, you want to be in the places that your well do not collapse because well is a very expensive uh, operation and you don't want to lose your well. So you want to prevent your sand production. You want to optimize well trajectory, so you don't want to go in direction that you will lose your well. Also, you want to maximize your production, so you want to be in the places that, if you want to do the hydraulic fracturing, they are in the places that you can easily do the fra hydraulic fracturing. And also, you want to design it. So all of them are in the area that geomechanics are dealing with. But how rock physics can help uh, to have a better results in this area? So we know that geomechanic model as an input, they need stress orientation and stress magnitude, and also they need the strength of the rocks. So they need two main uh, inputs. They need one stress and another one uh, uh, stress and strength of the rocks. So both of them can be guessed or can be modeled using rock physics and seismic together. So on the rock strength part, you may have young modulus and, uh, and Poisson's ratio. So based on that, you will have a, an idea about the brittleness of the rock and the place that you can easily um, uh, fracture the rocks. And from the stress, uh, you can have an uh, uh, estimation or you can have an idea regarding the maximum and minimum stress within a field based on the seismic velocities and anisotropy. I will show you quickly some examples. What do I mean here by stress and stress calculation using seismic? So on the strength one, on the, uh, you can uh, model brittleness. There are some uh, index named brittleness index. So you can go and find the interval within your well based on your, uh, let's say, well logs that are more susceptible to be, be, to be uh, fractured. Yeah? Here you see an example from West, West Texas shape. You see here I have on the first track from the right, I have the Schwann white model, implemented rock physics model to calculate Schwann uh, Poisson's ratio and Young modulus. So in the places that I have more brittleness and more ductile, I can just uh, have an, a better idea regarding them use, having these two curve overlaid on top of each other. So when my I have a low Poisson ratio and high Young modulus, normally it's more brittle zone. And may, when it's reversed, it's, it's more ductile. So it's better to do the fracturing in the brittle zones. Another one uh, is that when I'm getting this, let's say, Poisson ratio and Young modulus from my well log, then I can map them into my seismic. I do inversion and I map those values into my seismic. So uh, the next example is coming from the Elt, uh, Holden et al. 2013, one of my colleagues. They were doing the same operation on the well logs and then they transferred it onto the seismic. You see here, they have color coded the brittleness and it starts from blue to green, which green is the high brittleness and is best place for to having the drilling uh, well, let's say, design in that area. Here you see uh, we have few areas with the green area, uh, with the green color. So it's uh, better to have the well in those area if you want to have the fracture stimulation in, in that part. So this is the first part of the uh, geomechanic and the seismic together. It can give you the strength of the lo uh, rock for the subsurface as a brittleness index. The next part is the uh, stress magnitude and uh, orientation. Here is uh, there is another example for this one. Uh, 
So here you see, based on the anisotropy that you can get from your seismic data, so anisotropic seismic inversion here in a specific, I mean, you can get the stress direction, maximum stress direction from your seismic data. Here you see I have uh, some uh, some uh, fracture, some stress direction for, uh, at the well. It's shown by the red arrow. And I have some blue one. It's on the cross diapole uh, acoustic locks. And I get them from the uh, seismic. So you can see there is a very good match between these two, the one that we modeled through the anisotropic modeling uh, for the azimuthal inversion and another one which is measured at the well lock location. So it means that I have some measurement at well locations and then using the seismic now I have a cube of this maximum, st maximum stress orientation and this is very helpful for the geomechanics. Even I can go and have the magnitude and azimuth of these stresses. Here you see that in these two pictures is from the same paper. Uh, you can uh, have a, uh, you you can quantify the stress magnitude into the 3D cube. So here it shows how it can be done, and it's very useful because then you will have a 3D cube of your stress magnitude, and then you can have it as input your, to your geomechanical simulator and to simulate what you you are expecting geomechanics to do, and it can give you a more 3D results. And then the last part of my talk today is that about rock physics and simulation. So now you have the, uh, let's say all the well logs are, have been uh, denoised and you have a better well logs, you have a better seismic. Now what's the use for the seismic simulation? We have mainly two main data for uh, the, the link between the seismic and, uh, and simulation. One is called a seismic to simulation. This means that you will use your seismic through a rock physics model to fit into your simulation and then you do iteration until you get a good history matching. It means that you will drive the main reservoir properties from the seismic using inversion methods. You convert those uh, elastic properties into reservoir properties using rock physics model. You fit them into your uh, reservoir model and do simulation. You do the history matching. If you are happy with that, then the, it's okay. They are both on the same scale. If not, then you iterate on the properties that you derived from seismic and you do it until you get a good history match. So it, uh, what does it mean in simple words? Let's say you have a geological model. So if you want to do simulation, what normally you do? Normally you go to a simulation model. Yeah, You upscale your geology model. And then you need to use this uh, geology model into a simulation. So there is a boundary between these two. So, uh, so you use this simulation model into uh, your uh, fluid uh, flow simulation, and then you will have some results. You do not get good results, but you do. Normally, you go back to the simulation model, the reservoir engineer normally, back to, res uh, to the simulation model and update the simulation model. They don't care about the geological model or the properties there. And they do this iteration, iteration until they get a good results between, for you, their history match. So what we are offering here is that you have a geological model. Yeah. Then you go to the simulation model, the same step, and then you go to the simulation result. You don't have that boundary anymore. You don't need to jump over the wall. And then if you are you have this match, then you back directly to your geological model. It means that all of the properties that you get from the geologists or from the petrophysics, from the reservoir model, they can they should be updated until you get a good simulation results. And this can be done in several iterations and you can add it both structurally new uh, structures or changing your uh, reservoir properties, your porosity and permeability until your petrophysics, your rock physics, seismic and reservoir engineer all are on the same page. So this is called a seismic to simulation workflow. And then you, you update it, you have an updated simulation model, and then you will have a result. This is a workflow that I was talking about. This is a bit maybe complex, but what is interesting here is that the rock physics is located here. Yeah, this is the part that I was talking today. So all of the previous processes I talked with you so far are here in this, let's say, step. So you will do all the iteration and then you use them in the next as a part of this workflow until you get a good history match. This is the history match. That this is the part that you will examine your model against the fluid flow results. So you are getting information from other disciplines. This is one example, a very good example from our 2009. You see here, it has the, the uh, 
the uh, uh, pressure results and they are matching with the model one so on the blue they was uh, they were using the model without any faults so it was just some structure with, uh, on uh, without any faults and then after this doing these steps they found out if they added some faults it can be improved so they changed their geological model and then they have the new results with the red which is very uh, good agreement with what they get from the uh, let's say uh, reservoir engineering here uh, is a good example how you should back to your original geological model and then uh, update it instead of just going to the simulation model and this can be done even on the porosity and saturation part not just on the uh, let's say fault editing fault or editing fault or any structural parts so after you get a very good and then uh, you get a good uh, uh, let's say uh, simulation results then your final uh, prediction will be much more accurate here you will see that i have using the same model i have predicted different scenarios so uh, what if my water uh, i use water injection as eor because then after you have the reservoir model then you you need to know how much your production will be increased if you do any of the eor disciplines so now i have a calibrated model with seismic and with petrophysics and rock physics then i have a better feeling here so if i use only water injection i will have let's say 36 percent if i have gas injection 30 percent so you will you will have different scenarios and at the end you will see that the gas lift optimization will improve your production by 43 percent so this is another example that shows how that tune model can help you in a better prediction for your reservoir another uh, workflow is that simulation to seismic so far i was talking about that you start from seismic end up with simulation now this is another workflow that we also offer is that you start from simulation you have the simulation results you have the history match results and then you start from there you go back to the seismic to the rock physics model and then you iterate from that end of the this loop so you will improve your sw fee and sg into your rock physics model and then into your seismic and you will have a improved results based on that from your seismic so how it's done is that uh, it's done in a way that you have a reservoir model you you can have it as a 40 like in time zero and time t1 you do the rock physics modeling then you do overburden modeling and then you calculate seismic for each scenarios yeah and then you will see the difference between them so this is the 4d effect so you can have this 4d effect and then interpret or model this 4d effect to see what was the reason for this 4d effect so this is one uh, another example for this case you see i had this 4d effect here for gas flooding and also water flooding i had this with uncertainty so i did also moon color simulation in these parts and then i end up with these two different pictures of the subsurface for different scenarios so by following the same procedure, I generate free change probabilities for different scenarios if my SW is changes or if my uh, gas saturation is changes, which you see in the below. And furthermore, you can go and confirm them against the simulation result. Here you see the same uh, result for the seismic and on the simulation. On the right, you see the simulation. You see, I have two uh, scenarios from the simulation, and on the left, you see from the seismic. So this is the 4D seismic, show you how the fluid should, should be. So you see some noises there, that's uh, natural because it's seismic, seismic has some noises inherent in it. And on the right, you see the flow, flow simulation results. You see very good match between what you see in the simulation and what you get from the simulation to seismic. So this gives another hint that how this workflow can help you for a better results. So let me summarize what I have talked so far today here. I introduce you an integrated and iterative workflow between different subsurface disciplines that can be achieved through rock physics modeling part. So rock physics here act as a toolbar, as a sorry, as a toolbox. It's not a, a separate discipline, so it's a toolbox that connect different disciplines together. Uh, what rock physics can do it can help you to reconstruct elastic locks for the purpose of seismic inversion and characterization so you can share the information from one discipline to another discipline using seismic you can even uh, compensate for the missing data using using the rock physics data and it could be very helpful and make your results better so rock physics modeling normally start from the petrophysics so if you have a petrophysics uh, rock physics normally should be started from there and then you can update your elastic lock based on some theoretical or hybrid rock physics model and then you go to the next disciplines 
And this rock physics model furthermore can be used in geomechanics, reservoir engineer, or even in the seismic, your inversion, low frequency model, and different parts, as I show you some examples. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. So now I give the microphone to Jasmine for any questions. You can contact the presenter, Reza, at reza.saberi at cg.com, or if you'd like additional information on any of the uh, workflow or parts or software applications mentioned here, you can send an email to gs.solutions at cg.com. And we also have regional contacts, because um, I see that we have people joined from all over the world. Um, so with that, we thank you for joining our, our webinar today.